everyone. Welcome to our program, Books and Authors. I'm your host, Terry Kelly, and today we're speaking about a book entitled Mary's Mosaic, and the author is Peter Janney. Welcome, Peter. Great to be with you, Terry. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's great to have you here. As I told you, I could not put this book down. It's a sizable book, <laughs> and I think it took me two sessions to, uh, to read. It was just fascinating. So why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are, um, your background, and, and how you came to write such a fascinating book. Well, uh, the subject of my book, of course, is a, a woman by the name of Mary Pinchot Meyer. And uh, I grew up in Washington in the 1950s and the 1960s. And I knew Mary Meyer because I knew her family. I was best friends with her middle child, Michael. And Michael was hit by a car and killed, unfortunately, when we were both nine years old. And I lost my best friend. And so it was uh, a very difficult sort of moment in my life. But one of the most fascinating aspects of that grief was how Mary Meyer helped me in particular to deal with that grief uh, in a way that many other adults, including my parents, weren't able to. And so I always had quite an affection for this woman. She was an extraordinary human being, an even more extraordinary woman, and someone who was very different from the rest of the adults that I knew yeah. uh, it, during my parents' age. And of course, my mother and Mary Meyer had gone to college together at Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York. And my father and Mary's husband, Cord Meyer, both worked in the Central Intelligence Agency during the Cold War. So as families, we spent a lot of time together. They had three children. I had myself and my brother, and we were all about the same age. We went on camping trips together. We socialized a lot together. And so uh, this was a very important part of my life at the time. Almost an extended family. The Myers. Yeah, they were. I mean, we, yeah. we, we hung out quite a bit together. And uh, Michael and I went to school together. Our deaths were for two years side by side. We were often inseparable. Uh, I was out at their house in McLean, Virginia quite a bit, and, and he was at mine. We lived about 15 or 20 mi minutes away from one another. So it was, you know, it was an integral part of my life. Yes, and uh, the story is, the book actually is about the CIA and um, conspiracy theories and all the things that happened as you were growing up. And it's about the um, death of John F. Kennedy and a year later the death of this woman that you were talking about, Mary Meyer, whom you so loved and admired, and she was killed a year after him. Is there a connection? I know that I know the answer, but I'm pretending that I'm the viewer. Is well, there any connection between those two deaths? I, I make the case in the book that there's a very profound connection, and it, it begins with the fact that Mary Meyer knew John F. Kennedy at a very early age. They met uh, when she was 15 years old, and he was probably about 18. Uh, he came back to a prep school dance at the Choate School in Wallingford, Connecticut, where he had graduated the year before. And she was at this dance with another date, with someone else. And as soon as uh, John Kennedy laid eyes on her, I think there was sort of a, an instant attraction, an instant yeah. chemistry, and he spent the evening trying to cut in on her on the dance floor and to just find out, you know, wh who is who this is woman that I, I seem to be so magnetically drawn to. The interesting thing is that time is that they didn't really connect all that much. I mean, they didn't become boyfriend or girlfriend. They knew each other. Their paths intersected during college and into early adulthood. But it really wasn't until after her divorce in 1957, 1958, that 
she increasingly started to show up on his radar screen a little bit more frequently. And of course, after he was elected in the fall of 1960, that's when I maintain their intimate relationship likely started taking place, just as he was entering the White House in 1961. Now, um, the American public has been told certain things about the assassination of President Kennedy, and we've been told certain things about the CIA and about the various wars and the military-industrial complex. Um, in your opinion, or in your research, is what we have been told always the truth, sometimes the truth, or, or never the truth? <laughs> well, I hesitate to say this, but it's more likely never the truth or never the complete truth. Mm -hmm. uh, I think particularly during the Cold War era, the CIA kept a lot of secrets. Uh, I think as much as one third of our country's history during that period is unknown to us. We, we, yeah. we just don't know. It's buried in, in classified documents, uh, classified uh, arenas of one kind or another, mm -hmm. and it, it's unfortunate because a country that doesn't know its own history is destined, I think, to keep making the same mistakes over, over and, over and over again. Yes. Now, when you talk about the Cold War, I wonder if there are some listeners who might not know what that is. Can well, you just briefly explain? Uh, and also the, um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, some people might not know what that is because those are important events in this book. Right. Well, uh, after uh, World War II, uh, the Cold War started to take place in the late 1940s, and it was really a kind of uh, standoff between Russia and the United States. And people speak of the Cold War because a hot war would have meant nuclear Armageddon, and because both countries had nuclear missiles, had nu nuclear arms and technology of one kind or another. And of course, a nuclear war would, would ultimately render our planet uninhabitable. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we speak of the Cold War in terms of the tension between the two superpowers in the 1950s and the 1960s specifically where there was a lot of jockeying going on uh, between the two countries and a lot of crisis uh, particularly. And that came uh, to a huge head, what one author has called, called the most dangerous moment in human history with the Cuban Missile Crisis. That took place in October of 1962. And I think we were all very fortunate that President Kennedy and his inter sanctum of advisors were, were able to defuse the crisis so that there was no nuclear war, there was no conventional war. And uh, that was a real, in my opinion, a very critical turning point uh, in the administration of President Kennedy because it was after the Cuban Missile Crisis that I think he really began to uh, reconsider what the political trajectory of his presidency was going to be all about. And this is where I maintain that Mary Meyer stepped even more intimately into his life and helped him turn away from the Cold War toward world peace mm -hmm. and creating world peace. And he and Khrushchev were in friendly talks and things were going quite well, but was there someone or something uh, behind the scenes who didn't want that to continue maybe? Well, I, I think what the American public doesn't really know much of is that both Khrushchev and President Kennedy really wanted to get away from the Cold War mentality. Uh, there was this secret correspondence going on between them through letters uh, that were all sometimes delivered very secretively back and forth, where they would really express uh, their true feelings uh, as to what was going on with one another. And so this correspondence, I think, really helped lay the groundwork for what came subsequent to the Cuban Missile Crisis. And that 
really showed a very colorful face when, when President Kennedy in, in June of 1963 gave his comm commencement address at American University where he called on the citizens of our country and of every country to turn inward and look at their own resistance to peace inside themselves first and then toward other nations, other different people, and to really reconsider what peace could mean for everyone on the planet. And it was, a, it was possibly one of the most historic presidential addresses ever given in our country. And I think it's still, uh, it, we don't pay enough attention to it in terms of what President Kennedy was really trying to get people to see. Mm -hmm. And not everyone was on his side? No. There were certain factions within our own government, with, within the Pentagon, within the Central Intelligence Agency, that were just very upset about this. Th what they were really upset about was that they could not control President Kennedy in the way that they would like to. And he already felt that he had been kind of bamboozled by the CIA in the spring of 1961, barely as he just arrived in office, we had something called the Bay of Pigs incident, whereby uh, they thought they could lure President Kennedy into a full-scale uh, involvement with Cuba, there, thereby getting Castro out of Cuba. And President Kennedy got very smart very quickly and realized what was going on and would not allow that to take place. That became a critical turning point in his administration and it became a very uh, important juncture in, in terms of really his understanding who his real enemies were. <laughs> in the book you use the expression a shadow government. Can you tell a little bit about what a shadow government might be in, in this book? What well, it is? I, I think, you know, the term gets increasingly more and more familiar in our culture these days. Mm -hmm. But back then, uh, there really was a, a force within our government, uh, primarily engineered by people like Alan Dulles of the CIA yeah. and other members of the top Pentagon brass, uh, who really were taking a more aggressive, hard line toward Cuba, toward Russia. Uh, they uh, were seriously planning for World War III in the fall of 1963. Um, there were actual plans in, in terms of how that was going to take place. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this really uh, was sort of our first uh, glimpse of what the shadow government was attempting to do beyond the will of our president who, as we all know, the American people elect every four years. Yeah. Um, in this book, there are some very scary things and some very sneaky things. <laughs> and um, I kiddingly said that I wanted a bodyguard for today. <laughs> but um, speaking of the CIA and maybe other uh, such factions, is the CIA today the same thing that it was earlier at, at the time that you're talking about uh, President Kennedy and, and all this stuff in this book? Is it the same organization with the same um, ideas and goals today, or have there been any changes? Well, uh, clearly there have been some changes, but I, I, I think what your viewing public needs to understand is that during the, the 1950s and, and well into the 1960s, right, right up until the time of Watergate, uh, the, the CIA had no real oversight in Congress. I mean, essentially, they were given a blank check. They were a loose cannon. Oh, they were <laughs> a very loose cannon with a lot of money to spend it, when and if they needed to do so. Uh, and any time anyone uh, wanted to know the truth about something, a, a senator or a congressman, I mean, all the CIA had to do was holler national security, you know, and we can't mm. tell you that, which was really a dodge uh, to avoid any kind of accountability. Um, 
when we got into the area of Watergate, the whole Watergate crisis under President Nixon, uh, this is when some of the real dastardly deeds of the, uh, of the CIA started to come out, and it prompted some real subsequent uh, scrutiny on the part of Congress a after the Watergate crisis was over. So I, I think in, in terms of today, you know, the CIA is only one part of the national security apparatus, particularly since 9-11 but it still holds a very special place in, in terms of being able to carry out any number of kinds of operations, most of which, I would say 90% of which, the American public really never gets to know about. Yeah, we saw an interesting um, program on television, it was on the Health Channel, and it was about Frank Olson and the way that he died. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, well, was in the book. Yes, uh, there, there's actually been a great book written about that. It's called a, a Terrible Mistake. It's written by a man by the name of Hank Abarelli. Uh, it's a very well researched book, and I, I would recommend it in a heartbeat to your to your viewing public. Uh, Frank Olson had been working at an adjunct of the CIA at Fort Detrick in in Maryland, whereby he was working uh, with certain uh, substances that the CIA was very interested in, namely the hallucinogen, LSD, psilocybin, other uh, very exotic kinds of drugs. Psychedelic drugs. S psychedelic yeah. drugs, to be sure. And so uh, there was concern within the agency that Frank Olson might be coming a security risk. And so they uh, invited him to a party and uh, surreptitiously gave him LSD when he didn't know he was taking it. And of course, that can be a very frightening experience mm -hmm. for someone because you would feel when you take a drug that powerful that you are literally becoming unhinged. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it did drive Mr. Olson into kind of a crisis. He was... Uh, it was revealed to him uh, subsequently what had happened, but in the meantime, uh, they were having him, the CIA was having him reevaluated by several different psychiatrists who had been cleared to do this kind of work. Mm -hmm. And uh, they took him up to New York, and uh, when it was clear that uh, Mr. Olson's uh, personal trajectory was going to change, uh, I think there, he protested and he ended up getting thrown out of a 10th floor hotel window and of course uh, was, was killed by the fall. Right, and they um, were trying to pass it off as a suicide, one of many suicides that were occurring. And uh, I think his son was instrumental in proving that the way he fell out the window showed that he couldn't have fallen out or jumped out, he had to have been pushed out. Yes, his son Eric Olson, uh, really went on the offensive in terms of wanting to get to the bottom of what had yeah. actually happened. And they, in fact, finally cornered the CIA into coming uh, pretty, fairly clean as to what exactly had happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was, of course, a, a, a settlement involved. But uh, it, it still, that incident still remains uh, very uh, indicative of how the CIA can operate sometimes. There, there was a great little saying by someone who was a very uh, highly accomplished CIA asset in the 60s. His name was William Corson. And he told his protege, Roger Charles, once, he said, Roger, anyone can commit a murder, but it takes an expert to commit a suicide. Right. <clears throat> I underlined that in the book. Right. That was fantastic. <laughs> and, and if you read about some of the suicides, it's absolutely incredible. Uh, the planning and the devious activity uh, that went on and what they must have done and how they used one another uh, and, and just hid everything was uh, amazing. <laughs> it was hard to uncover anything. You did an incredible, incredible job of research 
and I know you're a psychologist, <laughs> so understanding human behavior as well as having that background in politics and having a father who was also in the CIA uh, gave you the perfect perspective to do uh, all this work on this book. It's absolutely incredible. And your friendship with Mary and her family, I was as I was reading it, um, it was just amazing how everything came together for you to be able to write such a book. Because I can't imagine, um, if you didn't have all this in your background, I can't imagine that you would have been able to do something like this. It's quite a feat. Well, <laughs> you know, it, it is in, in a way quite a feat. You're, you're absolutely correct about that. And, you know, I, I, I sometimes feel <laughs> like it was part of my destiny uh, yeah. to do this, should, should the need for it uh, ha had evolved, and, and of course it did. You know, I, mm. I didn't even find out about the fact that Mary was murdered until I came home uh, for Thanksgiving in the fall of 1964. She was actually murdered on October 12th, 1964, and I, I was in boarding school in New Hampshire, and I didn't hear, uh, I, I didn't know about it until I came home that Thanksgiving vacation, Wednesday night, the night before Thanksgiving, where my mother just, you know, told me at the dinner table. And as your readers will find out when they read the book, uh, it really, uh, that night sent me into kind of a dark night of the soul, you know, yeah. where I wrestled yeah. not only with her uh, recent death, but it sort of brought back memories of Michael's Michael. death as well. And it it had an impact on me. I, I think, you know, one way to say it is that her death haunted me for a number of years. Yes. And of course, it wasn't until 1976 that the, the public found out through a article in the National Enquirer that <laughs> she had had an affair with President Kennedy during the last three years of his life. I mean, none of us n knew about this until that time. And it was at that particular moment where I began to suspect that uh, we had not been told the real truth of not only what happened to Mary Meyer, but I always suspected that was sort of my demarcation line where uh, I really began to seriously uh, reconsider what we had been told about the, our, the assassination of our president in November of 63. Yeah. What you wrote about the trial um, of the Ray Crump, who was supposedly the killer of Mary Meyer, was fascinating because the trial, well, I won't give away anything, but um, it, it was just fascinating, all the detail and all the work you did dredging all that up. And of course, the attorney was a, an amazing person. Dovey? Yes. Uh, it, she was just astonishing the way well, she... Well, <gasps> that, that's, that's a very, that's one of the most fascinating, I think, events of the story. Because it were it not for this legendary Afro-American attorney, Dovey Roundtree, who was woman. based in, woman, who was based in Washington, D.C., had she not stepped up to the plate to defend uh, this, you know, very poor, indigent, you know, black day laborer, Ray Crump, uh, the government would have buried this case. Uh, mm -hmm. Crump would have been convicted and it would have be basically been put to bed. We'd never know. We would, we would never know. But Dovey Roundtree staked her reputation on this case. She also staked a lot of her own financial resources on the mm -hmm. case because uh, Ray Crump was, was poor. He had no money uh, for defense. I think he ended up giving her a dollar twenty-five or a dollar fifty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he had a dollar left. Yeah. he gave her a dollar. Yeah, and <laughs> that's right. And uh, you know, Dovey went to work. It was her supreme belief in justice and what justice should actually mean that she was not going to allow uh, this poor man be railroaded into be, being claimed guilty for a crime that he, he could not have ever have committed. I mean, yeah. what, I mean, they denied Mr. Crump a preliminary hearing, they withheld evidence and, until the trial, and what, what's clear by the time of the trial 
is that there really was not a shred of forensic evidence linking Mr. Crump to the murder scene or to the body of Mary Pinchot Meyer. And there was just, and it was a very bloody crime scene. Right. Uh, and there's just no way he could have pulled off the kind of stealth aspects of this murder. Uh, and then why would he have hung around the murder scene for 40 minutes later? I mean, he was literally found by a policeman trying to find his way out of the towpath area, and it was only about 560 feet away from the actual murder scene. I mean, if you'd committed a murder of that kind magnitude, wouldn't you have wanted to get out of the area? Get out of the way. <laughs> yeah, as yes. quickly as possible. Well, I mean, reading the way it happened, you know that that it was all a cover-up and all a fake, but to find out eventually how it was done, it, if it were only, if that were the only thing in this book, it would be well worth reading the book just for that uh, knowledge. But that's only one incident, and there are many more, and many cover-ups. And I wish we had more time; we could talk about more of them. But uh, there's the story of Kennedy, and um, the story of all the other suicides that occurred and all the warmongering and all the political stuff that went on. And through it, there's a thread of you and, and the way you felt and the way you thought. And I could see that, yes, it was haunting you. And I think that you came to a point where you had to write this book. And all I can say at this point is, thank you so much for writing it. I, I learned so much from reading it. I just had no idea about some of these things. You know, you read, about uh, conspiracies and theories. And at the beginning, I thought, oh, another one of those books. And then I started to read and said, wait a minute, this is different. And it was, it's just fascinating, the research you did and the personal element of your feelings and, and your life just make it a fascinating read. So I want to thank you so much for coming here today. Thank you, Terry. It's been great to be with you. Oh, thank you. And thank you for watching Books and Authors. This is Terry Kelly with Peter Janney talking about Mary's Mosaic and saying goodbye for now.